do not turn to Matthew 4. I know you, your Bibles may want to fall open there to Matthew chapters 1 through 4, but don't turn there, but you can turn to Matthew. Um, we are beginning a new series, a new short series this morning that I am calling Essentials. Essentials for the future of the church, the church in the West and the church here, First Baptist Church. And I cannot stress to you the importance of this series. And it is, as Adrian Rogers would say, in my humble but accurate opinion, essential. Here's why. Here's why I think this series is essential. First of all, it is a statistical fact that 70 plus percent of our churches in the United States are plateaued or declining. Now, if you're not familiar with that term plateaued, that means that it is just hanging on. It's not growing. It's not really declining in a measurable sense. It's just plateaued. But 70 plus percent of our churches are either at best plateaued or at worst, declining. A declining church with an attendance of 200 or more declines at 4% per year. Once it gets down to 100 or less, that rate picks up dramatically. In the words of Tom Rainer, once a church declines below 100 in worship attendance, it is likely to die within just a few years. It is a death spiral. Now, I want you to think about this reality with me. When you hear those words that if a church declines below 100 in worship attendance, it is likely to die within just a few years. I want you to hear me when I say that 80% of Southern Baptist churches in the U.S. run 80 or less. So if I put these numbers together in my head and I, and I realize that 80% of our churches in the Southern Baptist Convention run 80 or less or so in that range and a church that has less than 100 that is in decline will only last a few years, it's a death spiral and 70 plus percent of our churches are plateaued or declining, I'm trying to get you to see that times are changing and the landscape in America, as far as church goes, is about to dramatically change unless the Lord does something miraculous. You put these numbers together and you see that the majority of Protestant churches had less than 10 people commit to Jesus Christ in the past 12 months. That's less than a, one person a month committing to Jesus as Savior and you realize that the 30% of churches that are growing or, or are reporting growth are generally not growing by conversions. They're growing by transfers from other flocks into their flock. So even our growth numbers are skewed because the growth, for the most part, is not coming from people stepping out of darkness and into the light of Jesus Christ. They're coming from other churches that they're disgruntled with or somebody selling something a little more attractive down the road. I showed you a map a few weeks ago put out by Operation World and their research which showed that North America is one of the few places in the world, North America is one of the few places in the world where Christianity is growing at a slower rate than our birth rate. And our birth rate is not that great. Times are changing and they are changing fast. And if the church in the West, if this church in the Bible Belt has any hope of flourishing into the 21st century, I believe there are some essentials that we must embrace. And I want you to notice the words we must not just believe and nod to, but we must embrace. Now we're going to look at a series of five or six different essentials that I believe are essential if the church is going to see growth and flourish and survive in this 21st century and in the direction things are going. Now, I want you to know that they're going to get progressively more difficult to understand and swallow as we go, I believe. 
This morning we're going to start out easy, okay? And we're going to start with one that may cause some of you to roll your eyes because it's not like this is new information, but we're going to start out with the importance of embracing the mission. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 28 with me, Matthew chapter 28, I want us to consider this morning the essential and the importance of embracing the mission if we are to flourish into the 21st century. Now, I want to just say as you're turning in your Bible that you are doing an excellent job when it comes to financially supporting the mission. I want you to just think about this, that, that every dollar that is given in this church, 12 cents of that dollar, 12% of every dollar goes to the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention, which helps to fund international missionaries, North American missionaries, convention offices, seminaries, and on. You give generously to Lottie Moon, which every penny of Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes to international missionaries on the field. You give generously to North American Mission Board Annie Armstrong offering, which is this month, by the way, and you give generously to that, and all of that money goes to support North American missionaries like those we work with in Clarkston, Georgia, among the refugees. We give a 2% to a 3% to the Duck River Baptist Association every year and this year we're doing something a little different this year we added one percent one percent of every dollar given goes to our own church's mission efforts to put people from here on the ground in places like clarkston in places like germany in places like zambia in places like kenya in places around the globe and so far this year your gifts as you just put them in the plate your general offerings have totaled up to an average of $2,300 each month that goes directly to supporting our mission efforts at First Baptist Church. $2,300 a month on average. Not only that, but on fifth Sundays when we gather for communion and fellowship meal, we were going to take up a missions offering. And this past Sunday, you gave $3,152. $3,152. dollars on Sunday evening. To our missions offering so I want to say thank you number one and the people that you're going to send want to say thank you number two and I also want to say that we are doing a great job of supporting the mission and that is a vital part of it but as we enter into this sermon this morning I want you to ask yourself this question have I embraced the mission as my own have I personally embraced the mission as my own? Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. I know they're familiar to you, but let's look at them again with fresh eyes this morning. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore... And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Father, we ask you this morning to mold our hearts, to plow up the hard soil the fallow ground of our hearts. Christ, we ask you to give us your minds as we read your scripture, as we hear your scripture unfolded. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come and move upon us and apply the word to our lives. And God, I pray that every syllable of every word, of every phrase, of every sentence, of every subpoint, of every point of this sermon would be filled with your anointing and with your power and with your unction and with your Holy Spirit. God, we need you to speak and we need ears to hear and to understand what the Spirit might be saying to this church this morning. And we'll give you thanks for it in Christ's name. Amen. Have I embraced the mission personally as my own i hope that you will and we see three reasons for that in this text the first reason is simply this 
we, if we are Christians, have a master. We have a master. Listen to what that master says to us in verse 18. Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. So we see very clearly here, Jesus is claiming authority. And Jesus is utilizing that authority to say, Therefore, since I am your master, since I have all authority, I am telling you to go. We have a master. Now I want you to think about this with me, that there is not a soul anywhere on planet earth, in heaven or under heaven, that has more authority than the Lord Jesus Christ. There is not a soul anywhere that has more authority than the Lord Jesus Christ. The President of the United States does not have more authority than Jesus Christ. The Pope does not have more authority than Jesus Christ. The greatest prince, the highest king, the most wicked dictator, none of them have more authority than the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why whether we are citizens of this land or citizens of another land, whether we are ruled by a tyrant or whether we are ruled by a merciful leader, we have a constant king. We have a constant master. We have a constant authority. And his name is Jesus. And that does not change based on our surroundings. That does not change based upon our environment. And this does not just mean that Jesus has more authority than any of these people, though he does, but it means that any authority that anyone has, has to come from him because he has all the authority. Look again in that verse. It says, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me. So if Jesus has all authority, then it's not like when he dishes out pieces of the pie. Okay, I'm going to give this authority to you. I'm going to give 10% of the authority to you. I'm going to give 15% of the authority to you, and that leaves me with 60% of the authority. That's not how it works. Jesus has 100% of the authority and any authority that the president has he has only because Christ has it and is giving it to him and allowing him to have it any authority that the greatest prince or the worst dictator has comes from Jesus Pilate himself was told by Jesus you could have no authority if it were not given to you from above Jesus not only has more authority he has all the authority. He holds all the authority. And all the authority that anyone has on planet earth is only in their hands because of Christ and because of his will. Where does Jesus have this authority? He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. This is not just authority in heaven. This is not just authority on earth. This is authority in heaven and on earth. Now, if you turn over real quick to Revelation chapter 5, I think we can fast forward to the future and we can see how that authority really is magnified and unfolds before us in Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse number 6. Is there any doubt that Christ has all authority in heaven? Well, in Revelation chapter 4, there were four beasts covered with eyes with six wings who were crying out to the Father as He sits upon His throne, shining like a diamond, surrounded by an emerald rainbow, covered in, in these sounds and whispers and thunders and rumblings that are coming from this throne. And all they can say over and over is, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And He's surrounded by 12 elders clothed in white, and they're falling down before His face. They're throwing the, their crowns before His throne. All attention in heaven is on the Father. In chapter 5, Jesus enters the scene, and look what happens in heaven, beginning in verse 6. I saw between the throne, with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. 
And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And then in verse 11, I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus has all authority and is worthy of all worship in heaven, but not only in heaven, but also on earth. If you read on in verse 13, every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. This Jesus who gave his church the great commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, has all authority in heaven. He has all authority on earth. And we who claim to be purchased by his blood have the audacity to look back at him and say, well, the mission is not for me. That's not my thing. We have a master who has all authority in heaven and on earth and shouldn't he have that authority in his church? And that master has given us a mission. Now, if we have a master, we must be his slaves, right? A master is not a boss. A master is not a supervisor. A master goes with slaves. And that's how the Apostle Paul described himself over and over again in his letters. He would begin his letters with Paul. And some of your translations may say a servant of Jesus Christ. Other translations may say a bond servant of Jesus Christ. But if you were to translate that Greek word literally, it would be Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. The Greek word is the word doulos, which literally means enslaved or male slave. So Paul, as he went through his ministry, as he went through his Christian life, constantly wrote in his letters that he saw himself, he viewed himself as a slave, an enslaved male of Jesus Christ. And Paul's sole purpose was to please his master. And that must be our purpose as well, for we have a master, and his name is Jesus. And the Bible tells us very clearly that we cannot serve two masters. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. For he, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God. And I, I find it interesting, his choice of terms. You cannot serve God and Buddha. Well, you can't, but that's not what he said. You can't serve God and Muhammad. Well, you can't, but that's not what he said. You can't serve God and Confucius. You can't serve God and the pantheon of Hindu gods? Well, you can't, but that's not what he said. What did he say? You cannot serve God and wealth. 2 Peter 2.19 says, For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. Are we overcome by our master? Yes, we are. Now, whether that master is capital M master or lowercase m master, we are all overcome by our master. We are all enslaved to our master. The question this morning is, is our master the real master, the one who has all authority, the Lord Jesus Christ, or is our master something else that is enslaving us, like, for instance, wealth? Just one example of many. It's the one that Jesus gives us. 
Where are, where are we focusing our energy? Where are we focusing our time? Where are we focusing our dreams, our vision, our resources, our loyalties? The things that we tend to focus our energy, our time, our dreams, our visions, and our resources on, generally, if we were honest, are temporal things. We are slaves to stuff. We're slaves to pleasure. We're slaves to comfort. We're slaves to stuff. But what about eternity? How much, do we, how much of our energy do we focus on this life? in China some years ago and I was walking along with this uh, young couple and they were both believers and he was the pastor of, of a church there in China and um, his wife w was walking along and she was speaking and she, she said something in passing that really uh, got my attention because we were talking about property taxes and if you know if you've talked to me very long you know one of my pet peeves is property taxes I feel like you can pay off your house and think you're debt-free until you realize you're paying the government for rent each, each year that you live on the property. You never pay your place off because if you don't pay the government rent, the government will come and take your property, right? So who does it belong to, me or the government? Well, the answer's clear. Who gets it at the end of the day if I don't pay my rent? Property taxes. That's my soapbox for this morning. Now you know one of my pet peeves, property taxes. And I was talking about property taxes, and she makes this comment. She says, we don't pay property taxes in China. I'm like, really? I'm intrigued. No, we don't pay property taxes in China, but every 70 years, the government just takes back what everybody has. Wow. You mean you can work, and I'm passing farms, and I'm passing huts where people have farmed land for years? You mean you can, you can work this land, you can build a house, you can make a living, and in 70 years the government just comes and takes it all back? She said, that's what they do here. Everything we have will be gone in 70 years. And she says this with a smile, and I sympathize with her about that because I don't understand it. I can't wrap my mind around that. So I sympathize with her, and she said, oh, I don't care if they take what I have. I have a father in heaven who is building me a mansion that will last forever. And no one can take that away. And immediately I saw how my focus is on the temporal. My focus is on the earthly. And her focus is on the eternal. And her focus is on the heavenly. And we wonder why the church in China is exploding and the church in America is folding and in a death spiral it's because we aren't enslaved to the right master we have a master and his name is Jesus and he has all authority in heaven and on earth and if we are his children he should have authority in our lives as well which leads me to the second thing we see here is that we have a mission. We have a mission from our master. Jesus, in verse 18, came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, since I have all the authority, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Jesus makes the mission very clear here. First of all, go, therefore. The mission is rooted and grounded in going. And we are called, no, we are commanded to go. We're not called to go. We're commanded to go. And it's very clear, if you go even all the way back to the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 6, what does Jesus say from the throne in Isaiah chapter 6? Whom will I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, Here am I, Lord, send me. So this call comes from the throne room above in Isaiah chapter 6. This call comes even from hell beneath. 
You remember the parable in the Gospel of Luke of the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man is in hell, and he lifts up his eyes, and he looks to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, send Lazarus to my brothers that they come not to this place. That's the great commission from hell right there. The man in hell is pleading with someone to go to his brothers so that they won't have to go to hell with him. That call comes from all around us. The Apostle Paul had a vision one night of a man from Macedonia. And the man from Macedonia was saying to him, come over here and help us. There are millions upon millions of people who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ, who have no missionary, no pastor, no church, no opportunity to hear the name of Jesus Christ. And they are figuratively, figuratively, whether they know it or not, pleading and crying out, come over here and help us. Help us. The call should come from within. If the Holy Spirit lives in us, the Holy Spirit agrees with Jesus, right? I mean, doesn't the Holy Spirit always agree with Jesus? If the Holy Spirit is living in our hearts, He is agreeing with Jesus now, and we hear the call and the command from within with the Apostle Paul who said, Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. I can't live if I don't preach the gospel. And we have the command from Jesus himself. In Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Mark 16, 15, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in my name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. John 20, 21, my peace I leave with you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Acts 1, 8, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. How many times have we looked at these verses over and over where Jesus is commanding us to go? Jim Elliott missionary from the 1950s who died trying to get the gospel to the Alca Indians in Ecuador shared the clarity of the call in this quote as people begged a bright mind like him to stay in America why take your bright mind and your intellect and your abilities to a group of Indians in Ecuador And he writes this, in the 1950s, consider the call from the throne above, go ye. And from round about, come over and help us. And even the call from the damned souls below, send Lazarus to my brothers that they come not to this place. Impel them by these voices, I dare not stay home while Ketuas perish. So what if the well-fed church in the homeland needs stirring? They have the scriptures, Moses, and the prophets, and a whole lot more. Their condemnation is written on their bank books and in the dust on their Bible covers. American believers have sold their lives to the service of mammon, and God has his rightful way of dealing with those who succumb to the spirit of Laodicea. What would he say in 2019? The mission is to go, to get up and to go. And the mission is to make disciples of all the nations. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Now, I'm going to talk next Sunday morning about making disciples here locally. We're going to focus next week on that topic. But this morning, I want us to hone in on those words of all the nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. The nations. Now look very carefully at what Jesus says here. He is saying, go make disciples of all the nations. This doesn't mean as many people as possible. I'm going to try to make disciples of as many people as possible. That's great if we make disciples of as many people as possible. But that's not what Jesus is commanding us to do here. He is saying, go make disciples of all nations. He's not even saying, pick a country. All right, guys, it seems like this country is very open. It's very easy. They've got air conditioning. Their food doesn't give you stomach cramps. Let's go there and let's make disciples. Let's just invest there. It looks like a good place to invest, a safe place to invest, a comfortable place to invest. Just pick a country and get out of your time zone, and that'll count for fulfilling the Great Commission. No, his command is to go to 
every country. Go make disciples of every nation, all nations. Spread yourself among the nations. And the disciples understood this because what did they do? Immediately, they scattered and took the gospel as far as India, as far as Afghanistan, and on. They scattered throughout the known world. The Apostle Paul is constantly on the move as well. Turn to Romans chapter 15 with me. I want us to look at a lengthy passage of Scripture. I'm going to refrain from preaching on it. I just want you to look at what Paul is saying as he begins to close out his letter to the church at Rome. Now, we know the book of Romans as that intimidating, super deep, systematic theology. I mean, Paul is writing some deep things in Romans, don't, isn't he? He really fleshes out the gospel. He really unfolds the gospel for us. But do you know what the letter to the church at Rome was? The letter to the church at Rome was actually a missionary newsletter. It was a missionary newsletter where Paul is setting a theological framework and groundwork for getting the gospel to the ends of the nations. He begins in Romans chapter 1 and he moves all the way through the book of Romans and he comes to this last section of Romans and he gets to the point. And the point is, the gospel has come, all of these first 14 chapters I've written to you, they've come so that the gospel can get to the Gentiles and guess how the gospel is going to get to the Gentiles? People like me. And guess how people like me are going to get to the Gentiles? Churches like you are going to give me some money. So be ready when I come with an offering. Now look at this in, in Romans chapter 15. Beginning in verse 8, he sets the framework for the reality that from the beginning, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom was not just for the Jews, but it was for the Gentiles. It was for the nations. Verse 8 says, I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the, let's just note how many times the word Gentiles to glorify God. See how many times the word Gentiles is used. For the Gentiles to glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles. And I, and I will sing to your name. Again he says in verse 10, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. Paul is just quoting Old Testament scriptures for these Roman believers. And again in verse 11, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Hope in this promise that from the very beginning this gospel message has been meant not just for Jews, but it has been meant for Gentiles. Now I've given you the framework and the foundation, Paul says. Now listen to how, how, at how God is using me to reach these people in verse 14 concerning you, my brethren. I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all the knowledge, and able to admonish one another. But I've written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Stop right there, because I am going to preach on that verse just a real quick minute, because this is really neat. Paul is saying, I want to be a priest. And when I get to heaven, I want to be the intermediary between God and the Gentiles. And I want to offer up my sacrifice. Here's my sacrifice, Lord. It's all these Gentiles that I've brought into the kingdom. Here's my offering, Lord. And it's not seashells like we saw last week. It's not softball. And it's not 30-foot yachts. It is Gentiles. And I want that to be acceptable. 
and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, Therefore in Christ Jesus I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named so that I would not build on in another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see and those who have not heard shall understand. Here's what Paul's doing. He's saying, guys, I've got a whole litany of Old Testament verses that tell me that from the beginning God intended the gospel to get to the ends of the earth. And this is my calling to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. And I want to give God an offering of the Gentiles on the final day, I want to preach the gospel where it has not been heard yet. I don't want to build on another man's foundation. I want to go to all the nations. And here's how you can help me in this. Verse 22, for this reason, I've often been prevented from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I've had for many years a longing to come to you, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing, and to be helped on my way there by you when I first enjoyed your company for a while. You said, a little subtle, I'm coming and I need some help. I need some financial support to get me to Spain, but now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. Romans chapter 15 is the summary of Paul's missionary letter. He has laid a theological foundation for the church to understand that it is God's mission from eternity past, God's mission in the Old Testament, God's mission in the Gospels, and God's mission today to get the Gospel of Jesus Christ to every nation, to those who have not heard. And listen, listen, you can't serve God, you can't serve your master and wealth. So give me some money so I can go, Paul says. And the psalm we started out with, you may not have noticed this in Psalm 67. This isn't in your notes, but we read it, so I'm going to address it. Listen to how Psalm 67 starts. God, be gracious to us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. That's a prayer we can all pray, right? God, bless us. Be gracious to us. Cause Your face to shine upon us. But then notice what follows. That your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Don't you get on your knees and pray for God to bless you and cause His face to shine upon you so you can build a bigger 401k. Don't pray Psalm 67 1 without praying Psalm 67 2, which is, God bless me, cause your face to shine upon me, be gracious to me, so that so that we can get your name to the ends of the earth and your salvation among the nations. And then he talks about how the people should praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, all you peoples. Praise the Lord, all you peoples. And then he ends the psalm with God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. Now you think about this just a minute. If that's true, that God blesses us, that all the ends of the earth may fear him, when we stand before Jesus as the richest people on planet earth even if we are lower middle income people the richest people on planet earth he's going to say i gave you this to reach the nations what did you do with it go and make disciples of all the nations the ultimate mission of the great commission is to gather the nations around the throne of god and then thirdly baptize them Go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. This is a logical progression. Go, make disciples, baptize. Baptism is a public profession of a personal transformation. Colossians 2.12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. This is a picture of what Christ has done in our lives. This was the pattern in the New Testament. Acts 2.41, those who received his word were baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch, the Philippian jailer, and Lydia all heard the gospel, were baptized, and then teach them to obey. Go, make disciples of all the nations, baptize them, teach them 
to obey. Now, we Southern Baptists have mastered the art of teaching people stuff. We teach them knowledge. We teach them information. We heap up more and more and more knowledge, but that's not the Great Commission. The Great Commission is teach them to obey. It's like the preacher who started a new ministry and he preached his sermon on Sunday and, he, and everybody thought it was great. And he went home and the next Sunday he came back and he preached the exact same sermon. And, he, and everybody kind of scratched their head and thought, well, maybe he just had a, a, a moment, you know. And he came back the next Sunday and he preached the same sermon yet again. And they're all beginning to scratch their heads now saying, what did we get here? What is this guy about? He comes back the fourth Sunday, preaches the same message again. And finally somebody calls him on it and says, preacher, don't you realize you've preached the same exact message every Sunday for four Sundays in a row? When are you you're going to give us something else. And he said, whenever you start doing what I've been preaching the past four Sundays. That may be a more biblical model than what we do. Because the commission is to teach to obey. And I want you to think about the reality that the, the one who knows 90% of the Bible but is obedient to only 10% of it is more of a spiritual infant than a person who only knows 10% of the Bible and yet is obedient to what they know. We have a master, and he has all authority in heaven and on earth, and he has given us a mission, and that mission is to go, and that mission is to make disciples of every nation, and that mission is to baptize and to teach to obey. And the last thing I want us to see is that we not only have a master and a mission, but we have the means. What does he say there at the end of verse 20? And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, now think about this, okay? Think about this. Jesus stands up and he says, I have all the authority. Here's your mission. And God's I'm with you to the end of the age. Somebody, there's an engineer in that group, and he says, how long's the end of the age? How long's he going to be with us, guys? He, he's thought about this at another angle, and he said, he said I, I heard the mission part, and I heard what he told us to do, but I also caught there on the end that he's only with us till the end of the age. When is the end of the age? What does this mean, guys? Well, the good news is somebody there was recording notes. And he said, listen to what Jesus told us back in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Now, I want, you to, I want us to put those two things together. In essence, Jesus is saying, I am with you until this happens. I'm with you until the end. And when does the end come? When the gospel of the kingdom is preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, all the pontata ethne, all the people groups of the world. So we have Jesus with us. He is with us when we are doing this. Getting the gospel to all the nations. Obeying his command to make disciples of all the nations. We have Jesus with us. There are roughly 6,000 unreached people groups on earth totaling more than 2 billion people. Unreached does not mean unsaved. There's unsaved people right here all around us. There's unsaved people everywhere. Unreached means that they have little to no access to the gospel. People here can go to a hotel and there's a Gideon Bible in a drawer. They can pass 15 different churches with church signs inviting them in. Somebody at some point is going to hear the gospel if they open their ears, if they have any inclination whatsoever. Should we share the gospel with them? Yes. Should we try to make disciples of them? Yes. But to say they're unreached? No. They have complete access to the gospel. But there are people, some 2 billion people on earth that have little to no access to the gospel. And out of those 6,000 distinct unreached people groups, there are between 1,200 to 3,000 of those people groups that are not only unreached, 
but they're unreached and they're unengaged. And that means they have zero access to the gospel. They have no Christian, no preacher, no missionary, no church, no hope of ever hearing the name of Jesus unless it's taken to them by someone else. And we have the means to reach them. I'm not talking about money, though we have the money. I'm not talking about resources, though we have the resources. I'm not talking about talent or energy, though we have the talent and the energy. We have the means to reach them, and His name is Jesus. And He is all that we need. Now, I know that most of you, if not all of you, have heard me pontificate upon this subject multiple times since my arrival, have you not? We spent eight weeks in the summer preaching on Acts 1-8. We spent eight solid weeks preaching Acts 1-8. And yes, we give generously to missions. And yes, we're seeing a number of people who are beginning to take steps to go with the gospel to internationals and to unreached peoples and across the globe. But here's what I want you to understand here this morning. Here's what I want you to hear above all else this morning is that this is something that we must not only nod to. This is something that we must not only say amen to. This is something that we must not only just believe in and be able to walk out of here and say, hey guys, we're mission-minded. We're a mission-minded church. No, this is something that we must embrace if this church is to flourish and to survive in the 21st century. This is something that we personally must embrace. And you need to ask yourself this morning, what is your role? How are you going to embrace this mission? Maybe this morning you need to commit about more than you've ever committed before to pray like you've never prayed before for missionaries, for mission teams, and for unreached and unengaged people groups. Don't you think that's not an embracing of the mission? Don't you think that's an investment? Some of you are going, I can't, I can't hardly get to church, much less to Afghanistan. It's not going to happen for me. You can pray. You can hold the ropes but when you hold the ropes in prayer, you make sure that you have blisters on your hands. Amen? Commit to a new level of praying for the mission. Commit to a new level for praying for an awakening among the unreached and the unengaged. That may be your role in this thing, and it is not a lesser role. It may be the greatest. It may be the greatest role. Commit to pray. Commit to pray and or give. Maybe you need to step up your giving and say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut back on the vacation time. I'm going to cut back on the pleasure seeking. I'm going to cut back on this area and that area, and I'm going to give more to the mission. Maybe you, can, maybe you need to commit to go. You know, and God's been working on you for some time, that you need to just take that step and take that risk and go. I read a quote from an old missionary. I think he's dead now. He has to be to say something this smart. But he said, you may as well have rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis in India as, as here. Now you think about that. If you're going to be sick, you may as well be sick there and be sick here. Maybe you, you, you've had every excuse in the book and you know it's time to pull the trigger and say, I'm going to go. Did you know some of the largest groups of people that are being sent overseas as missionaries by the International Mission Board are retirees? Most retirees live 20 years after retiring. 20 years! And they're going and they're serving and they're investing them their last years in their greatest mission. Maybe God's calling you to commit to pray more, to give more, to go, or to send. Maybe you're in a position where you say, I can send a missionary, and I will send them full time, and I will raise them up, I will pray for them, I will encourage them, I will write letters to them, and I will financially support them to go and to do the work. I don't know what God's calling you to do, but what I'm begging you to see this morning is that we must embrace 
embrace personally the mission. It is essential, and the future of the church depends on it. This is a matter not of preference, of opinion, of a soapbox that I like to get on. This is a matter of obedience. This is what Jesus left us here to do. It's a matter of obedience, and it is our purpose. And I want to ask you to fulfill it. I'm asking you to fulfill it and to embrace it together with me as we pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace, and we thank you for giving us a role in being part of your mission. God, you could have reached the nations any way you chose, but you chose to call us out of darkness and into your marvelous light and to command us to play a role in that. And God, I pray that we would not just give lip service to the mission, but I pray this morning that you would stir in our hearts and renew in our hearts the absolute essential of personally embracing the mission as our own. You have given it to us. Help us as individuals to embrace it as our own and to commit to pray more, to give more, to go farther and to send people as you would lead and give opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? And this, this verse is a good verse to, to end on this morning. Let's sing it together and let's sing it to Jesus and believe what we sing to him.